There has never been a better time than now to come join the Belicio Foods team. Belicio has a new contract in place with plenty of awesome perks for their employees. From increased wages, access to the free health clinic, vacation after six months, and much more, Belicio Foods is committed to putting their employees first. For more information or to apply, visit BelicioFoods.com slash careers. Take advantage of these great new employee benefits and join the Belicio team today. Visit BelicioFoods.com slash careers to learn more. We at Orange Crush have many things to be thankful for, including everyone who makes Orange Crush a part of their day. To show our thanks, Orange Crush, WKOV, and participating Save-A-Lot locations will be giving away Thanksgiving turkeys to dozens of winners because even though Thanksgiving celebrations still might look different this year, we know Thanksgiving favorites will still be a part of your plan. Visit gjpepsicontest.com slash turkey to find out where you can enter to win now through November 18th. No purchase is necessary. See official rules for details. Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Morning Show right here on Main Street TV. And our good friend, newsman, Phil Buffington, is here today to do the morning news update. And, of course, that's always brought to you by Nia Henry, agent for Appalachia Realty. If you are looking to buy or sell or have any real estate needs, give Nia a call, 740-418-4135, and she'll work hard for you because that's what she does. And Phil... Where have you been all our lives? We haven't seen you in a while. See, you move away yeah. to the new fancy building and you forget about us. Yeah, I guess. It, it's too far of a drive for me. Oh, what? Yeah. Like they the keep me locked in there. A couple they blocks down the road? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they don't let you leave? They don't invite me over here too often because they never know what I want to say. I'm a wild card. I well, said, they feel like that about us every day, don't they, James? <laughs> oh, that's okay. Hey, listen, we have Carman the Carman that comes in. You never oh, know what yeah. he's going to say. That's a good point. I so, didn't think of that. Yeah. <laughs> Although, typically, it's 100% of the time it's funny. Oh, yeah. So. I, can, I can see that. Yeah. But, no. Um, so, Pete is off uh, for a couple of days, and mm -hmm. we didn't get to do the news on Monday. Okay. So, I know that you are kind of full of, of a lot of things going <laughs> on. And then you... Um, Actually, I thought it would be interesting. You did kind of a story, just a, an interest piece, I guess it would be, or an investigative piece almost. Yeah. Um, there in the for for uh, something in kind of in the Wellston Vinton County area, and I yeah. thought we could talk about that too. Okay. Because um, that's really interesting. Yeah, it was. Um, I found out about it just by chance. Uh, one day in the past couple of weeks, the scanner went off and we had heard that there were uh, divers in Wellston um, down around the strip mine area. So I, you know, took the trip down. I took a couple pictures. I spoke to uh, some of the people that were there mm -hmm. and I come to find out that it, inv it involved um, a missing person who had actually been missing since the 1960s. So I followed up with somebody I had met there, um, that afternoon, this was earlier this month, I think it was the 7th, um, and his name was Gary Long. So I got Gary's contact information. I spoke to him on the phone a mm -hmm. few times, um, and I've learned that Gary is one of, I think, eight or nine children that um, were, his father actually went missing in 1969, in the fall wow. of 1969. And he said that his dad worked for the uh, B&O Railroad and he would be gone throughout the week. He would leave Sunday evening or Sunday morning, come back Friday evening. Um, As many people do. Right. And he said that uh, on one occasion, he just didn't come home. And not only did his dad, you know, go missing, his vehicle went missing, which was a, a new or almost new uh, Pontiac Catalina. And the tags were never renewed throughout all the years. He had never heard or seen anything about his dad other than rumors that had started to circulate from an early age. Sure. Um, so I, I spoke a lot with Gary. Um, so a true unsolved mystery. Like, yeah. Dude just disappears. Absolutely. And, wow. Uh, Gary said that even from a young age, people would approach him and say, you know, I heard that so-and-so put your dad in his vehicle in the strip mine pond there in Wellston, which is just off State Route 327 near the recreational sports complex, um, close to the main school campus for Wellston. Okay. Um, 
there's Jacob Grubbs uh, with the chaos diving team. They're the ones that performed this, this search. This wasn't the first dive. The first dive came in the summer of 2020. Um, and that had come up because there was a fisherman on Lake Rupert in Vinton County. Okay. And he was out on his boat and he had a sonar device and he saw a vehicle that had been submerged and was on the lake bottom. And he had posted those pictures on Facebook. Well, Gary and some of his family had noticed that and noticed that it was the same type of vehicle that his father would have been in. Um, it was a big bodied old model car. Um, so they, they started to think, well, you know, maybe that's what happened after all this time. Maybe he had an accident or... Right. Cause Lake Rupert would be honestly easy to drive off into. Well, and he, he said this too, and I didn't know this, but apparently right around that same time, 68, 69, uh, Lake Rupert, um, was man-made. So there was actually a road that you can even see in the pictures with the vehicle that was submerged that went across where the lake is now. And Gary admitted that his dad, you know, was a drinker and, you know, he thought maybe yeah, he just accidentally forgot, you know, that the road wasn't there anymore and drove off into the lake. Well, it turns out uh, the Vinton County Sheriff's Office was contacted, who contacted BCI out of Columbus. They sent a team of divers down. They retrieved the vehicle. It ended up being a 1970 uh, Ford Fairlane. Or Galaxy, I can't remember oh. which. It was a big-bodied vehicle. It was, and it yeah. was around, around that same you know time. But that is what sparked their interest into thinking, you know, maybe there was something to these rumors after all these years. Um, so they started to look around on the Internet. They found a group called Adventures with Purpose, which is actually a group that works in conjunction a lot with the Chaos Diving Group that came down um, and actually did the search in October earlier okay. this month. Um so they, they did search the strip mine pond. He said they actually went in down. Wait, um, is that the po- Is that what they searched? Is that Lake That's Rupert? Lake Rupert. That's yeah. Lake oh. Rupert. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that big. Yeah, I didn't either. Wow. But they, they went in back toward where the North End basketball courts in, are in Wellston, and they made their way back to just behind where the ball fields are. They found a car. Uh, the diver that James showed earlier came up with a license plate, but it was almost immediately noticed that the license plate was a bicentennial plate. Yeah, pretty pretty current license plate. Yeah. Came out in about 2001, 2003. Yeah. Uh, they later pulled that vehicle out. It was a 1992 Ford Thunderbird that had actually been reported stolen in Wellston around 2002, 2003. Um, but just in the conversations that I overheard while I was there to get the pictures uh, that day, um, the diving group who work across the country um, and have actually solved a number of uh, missing persons cases. Wow. Uh, they expressed interest in coming back and said that they would be willing to search again because the vehicle that they pulled out, the Thunderbird, the diver said that he could only see, other than the tires, he could only see about eight inches of the bottom of the car and the rest was sunk in, in the mud. So oh. after 20 years, you know, it had been you know, submerged and sunk that far. So if you add another, you know, 30 years to that, which is how long sure. his dad has been missing, the vehicle could be completely covered. Um, but luckily that diving group knows um, a team out of Indiana that has a magnetic device that could actually pull that, it out. That's what I was going to say. It would be, there have to be devices that you can mm -hmm. scan the, the bottom and figure that stuff out, but it's not, it sounds super easy, but I'm sure no, it's it, not at all. I'm sure it's not. Um, so, not the, like you're diving in the Caribbean or, or something, right? Where you see it's very fish murky. And, yeah, it's very murky and dark. Um, yeah. But that team, the Chaos Divers, have um, said that they would be coming back as soon as next spring okay. to do another search. Um, and the Long family, though there have been rumors of wrongdoing, that you know involved in all this. They're not really looking for anyone to point a finger at. They just want to have some closure. Their dad never had a funeral. They, there's no gravestone for him. Um, the long children, their mother went to her grave thinking that, uh, his name is Thomas Alfred Long is the, the okay. person that went missing. She went to her grave thinking that he just ran, ran off with another woman. Okay. Um, Aww. so that's so sad. Yeah, they went their whole lives, not really knowing. And I mean, Gary's 58. One of the, um, I think the fourth oldest sibling has passed away. I think the oldest, Tom Jr., is probably close to 70. So these people would like to know, you know, what happened. 
So hopefully that will uh, help getting this out there. The story has never been told before, according to some of the family members. After all these years, no That's one had ever so really wild. said anything. So 52 years later, they're just now starting to uh, piece some things together. So hopefully they can figure this out. It was very interesting to talk to these people, and as sad as it is, hopefully there's, you know, some resolution. Yeah. Isn't that wild, just that all came from you heard something on a scanner? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I never really, I mean, I didn't expect that would be the case. We had heard a little bit about when the team from BCI came down to Vinton County in 2020, and we were told that we would be informed of what happened after the fact, and it just kind of went away. And you know, so it was in the back of my mind that that had happened, but I didn't know that's what I was walking into that day. I wonder if they were able to um, identify the the old Ford that was in Lake Rupert, like I'm not why sure. it was there, whose it was, or how it got there. Or... That's what I thought was interesting too. Every time that they go, no one look, talks about that. They, every time they go look, they find a car. It's just not the right car. <laughs> right. And so why are all these cars in these bodies of water? But that's, I guess that's an, another story. <laughs> Uh, we know why the one in Wellston was in the water. It was stolen. Um, but I guess, I mean, anyone familiar with the strip mine area in Wellston and the waters there, they searched that spot behind the ball fields. Now, there's a separate section of that across the road as you get closer to the entrance to the main school campus that they're going to look. There's a big drainage pipe there that runs uh, beneath the road. They're going to search there. And I think they're going to search closer to the high school baseball diamond, okay. which is also separate from that main section where they looked uh, the first time around. So we'll see how that plays out. And when they come back, uh, maybe we can do a follow up. That's really interesting. And you're exactly right. You just hope <clears throat> for the family that they could get some closure. I mean, I, I think yeah. that we know by now he's not coming back. Right. Um, yeah. So, but just to find out what happened would be. I don't know why as humans we need to know that, but we just do. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I guess I'll talk about Karen Bach while we're in Wellston. Uh, Karen's last day is tomorrow. Aw. Uh, she has been superintendent in Wellston for quite some time yeah, now. she is. Yeah. Uh, she actually had um, a little retirement party there in Wellston at the, at the depot earlier this month. I believe it was on Sunday the 10th. Um, but she has been the superintendent in Wellston for the past 11 years. And she announced just before the start of the school year this year that she would be uh, retiring effective uh, toward the end of this month on the 29th. Um, she has been in education for a total of 38 years. Um, she <clears throat> attended, she's actually from I think she was born in Indiana and then moved uh, at a young age to Lancaster. She attended the uh, William Fisher Catholic High School in Lancaster and then went on to Ohio University in Athens. She graduated in 1983 with a bachelor's degree in special education and then went on to earn her master's degree in educational administration at OU in 2001. She started out teaching in Vinton County in special education. Um, she had a brief stint in Taze Valley and then went back to Vinton County, and then she ended up in Alexander, where she would eventually take on her first administrative role as the uh, curriculum director there. <clears throat> and then she moved into Wellston, I believe in 2007, as the curriculum director for the Wellston District. And then shortly thereafter, she um, was awarded a contract in August of 2010 to replace the departing superintendent, Eric Meredith, and that's the position she's held ever since. Um, it was very apparent from the comments we've gotten uh, in writing the story and posting the story and during her uh, gra or her graduation, her retirement party there in Wellston that she is going to be very missed. She was thought fondly of. Mm -hmm. um, so we wish her the best. She says uh, when I asked her what she plans to do with her retirement, she did say that she has aspirations to continue in education. So we'll see where that leads. Um, she might not hang it up just yet, so she might build upon that 38-year education career that she's uh, that she's established. So we'll see how that plays out. You know, it's interesting. You hear a lot of <laughs> folks say, you hear the word retirement, and then that lasts about five minutes. Mm -hmm. It's like 
I don't know, sometimes it's in your blood and you don't realize that you um, need a break maybe for a second, but then you're like, oh, well, unfortunately, this is what I meant to do. I mean, I didn't delve into this in the story, and I'm not going to go into detail because I don't really know, but there has been some animosity there in Wall Street yes. between board members and uh, the administration. So I think that pl probably played uh, a little into this decision. Sure. Um, but that's unfortunate because the people that were closest to her know how valuable she was. And before she came, I mean, Wellston had, I think, three or four superintendents that were there for maybe a year, maybe two, that didn't live in Wellston and weren't from the area. So it was a rarity to find somebody that would stay for over a decade that actually lived in the community, that sure. had a vested interest in the community. Um, so hopefully that's something that um, can be somewhat replaced. Uh, as of right now, um, I think it was effective the 12th of this month. Uh, Mary Ann Hale is going to be the interim superintendent in Wellston for this school year, the remainder of the school year. Mm -hmm. um, and the board has actually contracted with the Educational Service Center to conduct a superintendent search. So I'm not sure if Mary Ann is going to be in that. Sure. Um, race. She's out of Benton County, right? Right. She's yeah. actually a, a board of education board member. member yeah. And she was a longtime assistant superintendent in Benton County. So it's, we'll see, you know. So it's not her first rodeo either. No, not okay. at all. Good. So she's, they've, they've got a wealth of experience there right now, at least for this school year, for the remainder of. So um, we'll see how that plays out. Well, that's a good thing. And, and um, you know, sometimes we all need change. Yeah. So yep. if anything, the past couple of years has <laughs> taught that. Um, yeah. Someone was telling me about, have you guys heard about, um, like, the Great Resignation I guess it's this whole oh yeah movement mm -hmm. thing. I mean, we'll have to do a story about that sometime. A lot of people stepping away from their jobs at this point. Stepping away, yeah, or just stepping away from work entirely. Whatever, <laughs> yeah, or just stuff, you know. Yeah. Just stepping away from from things, and um, I guess it you know started as a term, and it's become this ginormous, almost like revolution or or whatever. So. Um, and one of my friends was telling me about it, so I kind of looked it up. And then it was funny. I was driving to work the other day, and uh, I was listening to some talk show, and uh, they were talking about it. And I was like, oh, this really is a thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So There have been entire restaurants have to shut down because their whole staff walked out. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's Don't give them any ideas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> I hate you right now. No. No. Thing. No. no. Do no, it's, but no, that is true. It's, it's, or other businesses yeah. where everybody just is like, I'm not doing this anymore. Yep. So sometimes you just wonder where all of this COVID stuff has fallen into people's decisions. But. Yeah. Um, we'll move on to some news out of Jackson. Um, I covered the Jackson council meeting this past Monday on the 25th and the, Majority of that meeting, which was just short of an hour, was spent discussing, uh, Mayor Evans was discussing the recent unfair labor practice complaints that were filed against the city in the past few months. Um, I'm not as familiar with this as what Pete would be because this is actually Pete's beat. Yeah. But um, I thought Randy did a pretty good job of concisely uh, breaking down step by step what happened in this process. There's been a lot of rumors, which was another part of why he wanted to discuss this during the meeting, um, about how much money this has cost the city, which Randy basically said, you know, we're there's gonna be a little bit of money they have to pay out for the different pay structures. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. He basically wanted to dispel his rumors and put it all out there for everybody to understand. Gotcha. Um, so, I mean, basically, he started this whole discussion out by saying, I'm going to be known for two things as Mayor Jackson. The attempted reorganization of the city's administration and the income tax. One of those is very bad. One of those is very good. Um, but regardless, he, he feels as though that's what he's going to be remembered by. And he, he prefaced this by saying he wanted to discuss it because a number of the council members in Jackson have been approached by people in the public and um, even, you know, accosted with accusations of certain things. And these council members felt as though they couldn't discuss it because a lot of these things, you know, involved unions and contracts. And some of these discussions were held in executive session, which are legally not allowed to discuss 
in public. Sure. Um, but now that this whole thing is done, um, he felt that it was something that he could go ahead and talk about. Okay. Um, and he, he said the attempted reorganization of the city of Jackson's management structure was done. Um, he said to ensure that things were being done according to the letter of the law. And, um, that was, that was it. They just wanted to do things the right way. So he said he wasn't out to get anybody. He wasn't out to, you know, break the unions up. He said he went directly by the ORC and the, um, CERB guidebook, which is the state employment relations board, which is the entity through which these complaints were filed. Um, so when they first, when he and uh, service director David Swackhammer first took over, uh, Mayor Evans says they spent about the first six months just learning the process, you know, looking through the law, looking through the guidebooks to to learn, you know, the the job. They were both not connected with city government prior to this. Correct. I mean, they came in blind yeah. for sure. They were both, that you would know, be tough. in the private sector. They had no idea of, you know, how this was supposed to work. So they were familiarizing themselves with. Um, the city's management and employment structure with the rules and regulations of how a city is supposed to operate. And in the mayor's office where there were four positions after that six month period or so, Randy and um, David decided that they only needed two. So they wanted one of these positions to be focused on human resources, HR, you know, payroll and, you know, all that. And then they wanted another one to be focused on projects, like a projects coordinator position, which is uh, held by Tracy Plants. And the HR position is currently held by Tanya Hatton. Um, so once they decided to do that, they offered those two positions first to um, two employees that were already there. One took a voluntary layoff because they wanted to leave the area, which they did. Okay. And the second was laid off. And I'm not naming anyone because Randy didn't name anyone. And like I said, I'm not familiar. I think I know who these people are, but I'm not <laughs> going to say it. Yeah. Um, so the other person was actually laid off by the city administration because there wasn't a position left to have. So next, after that was done, they moved on to the supervisory staff in the city, which consisted of eight superintendents who were in a superintendent's union. So it was determined with the two aforementioned positions and with these eight superintendents positions, they felt like according to the CERB uh, guidebook and ORC, these positions should not be in unions. So that was their first uh, takeaway. And that's so, where we got into like this whole super uh, superintendent versus super, what was the other word? Well, supervisor or they, or... they were They were known as superintendents when they got there and then when they restructured or attempted the restructure, they named them department heads. Okay. Um, and they felt as though since they're actually supervising, they're direct supervisors of other municipal employees, they should be non-union, which they say is according to the rules set forth by CERB. So I know that we got into a matter of semantics with, it, it with really words. Did. It really did. Yeah. So those eight positions they felt could be narrowed down just a little bit. So they combined two into one. So eight became seven. Superintendents became department heads. So they actually even, in addition to researching the law and the CERB guidebook, they also consulted with the Dublin-based law firm of Clemens, Nelson & Associates, um, which is a group that was hired by the previous administration to assist with uh, contract negotiations for the AFS, CME, and OPSI unions. Which they're huge, yes. like big, 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 big time. Yeah. Attorney firm. Yeah. And and then in reducing the number of superintendents there again, uh, Mayor Evans said that that was done because he he and the current administration and council want to be as efficient as possible with taxpayer dollars. So they felt they could, you know, do things according to what they felt was the right way to do things and save money at the same time. So after these were made, uh, after these changes were made, the unions involved, which there are three total unions involved, um, they said that the, the union representatives felt that the positions that were vacated represented unfair labor practices. So, and as Randy explained, this is not an arbitration. It's not a lawsuit. It's a filing to a state agency, which is CERB. And it's a filing that basically says, we don't think this is fair. Right. 
doesn't it doesn't say you know what, what you did was illegal it just it's unfair which is exactly what it is it's named that so when serve investigated this after you know a couple months or so they came back in agreement with the union that the complaints were valid that the, that this was unfair um, and Randy pointed out also that Serb didn't come back and offer an opinion as to whether or not these positions should be union or non-union. They just said that the process by which you made these changes was incorrect or unfair. Um, so the city reserved the right then to take that matter to court and fight that decision, but they decided not to. Instead, they did exactly what Serb recommended. They re-implemented all the positions that they had previously vacated. Mm -hmm. All the all the positions that they deemed to be, you know, non-union were put back into the union. All the people were brought back. Um, and now they're all basically doing the same work that they were in the same jobs that they were in the same union that they were. And as, as Mayor Evans said, there was no real harm done, no big additional expense. We put them back and that's where they are now. So during the meeting Monday night, um, Mayor Evans pointed out too that this week is when union negotiations uh, ne negotiations oh, no. kick back off. So yeah. he says that their position hasn't changed. They still believe that what they did was the right thing to do. It was just not the right process. So now that this is the official right thing to do, they're going to re-examine um, the steps that they took before and do it in what they think is the right way to do it. Um, through negotiations with Serb and the unions, and they're going to try to do this again, is what it sounds like to me. Oh. Um, well, so I'm just going to say one thing, and I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to anyway. Seems to me like this law firm kind of let them down a little bit. Possibly. I mean, you're talking about one of the, or if not the premier labor law firms in the in the not the state the country and i don't know how they messed that up i'm not so sure either um but anyway that's just jen asking the question <laughs> and then at the end of the discussion i mean randy is obviously pretty upset at this point he's gone through all this he's had to sit with his mouth shut for all this time because he couldn't openly discuss it and all the while there's been rumors and uh social media posts um which he directly um addressed mm -hmm. Monday night. So he, this is a quote from Mayor Evans. When someone puts out their own social media and spreads, spreads rumors about all this arbitration, the city has lost and that has cost us thousands. I've even heard a million dollars and you guys feel like you can't respond the council members because it's stuff that's been discussed in executive session. That's horse crap. And that's when he was obviously becoming a little perturbed. And he also pointed out too, that during his tenure as mayor, during the current council's tenure as council members, there have been absolutely no instances of arbit. There's actually, well, sorry, there's been one instance of arbitration which actually went in the city's favor, had nothing to do with this reorganization stuff. Okay. And there have been no lawsuits, none. Um, so th there again, he pointed out that these were unfair labor practice complaints. It cost the city, definitely didn't cost the city a million dollars. I'll say that it cost thousands of dollars. Um, he got into exactly what would involve money. And he said, you know, there was a little bit of a difference with the pay structure for the new job versus the old, and that the city's in the process of figuring out exactly what is owed to whom, and then that will be paid. I assume that's probably not going to be anywhere near the thousands and up to a million dollars that people are um, allegedly claiming on social media or out in the public. Um, and he also pointed out, too, that in the past two years, the current council has cut the budget in Jackson by about $5 million. Um, so then he, that was to address the claims that the city is squandering taxpayer money. Um, he also pointed out too, that the city currently has 83 employees versus the 93 that it had three years ago, which if would have, you know, if those numbers would have stayed the same, that would amount to uh, about a half a million dollars in extra payroll expenses for just this year alone, had those same number of employees been kept on. So he wanted to tout the fact that the current council and administration are doing their best to be um, efficient and to do things according to the law. And he also pointed out too that this current council was the one that implemented the city income tax in Jackson for the first time ever. Although there had been one put on before that was almost immediately taken back off 
Do you remember? Yes. Um, this yeah, one was actually months, I think. <laughs> right. This one he said was actually done the right way. He went to the voters. It got passed. Oh. It's for five years. He hopes that you know now that you're seeing street paving and all the other improvements being done in the city, the fact that the police department didn't have to be you know whittled down to next to nothing, mm -hmm. that the community sees the value in that and that they make it a permanent income tax, which almost every other city in Ohio has, almost yeah, every we other city in the country two. has. Yeah. That, that didn't have an income And tax. I think the other one is Yellow Springs, which is yeah. a wealthy community. Yes. That, yeah, that's why they don't have an income tax. Um, but yeah, so that, that was the first time that I know of that it was broken down in such an easy to understand and direct way. Um, I know Pete has covered this extensively. He's got stacks and stacks of, you know, legal documents outlining these complaints. Um, but this is the first time that I know of that it was broken down like this and explained in such a way that everybody can understand um, where everyone stands and how everything went. And he wasn't trying to hide anything. You know, it, this didn't go in the favor of the city at all. It didn't go the way that they had planned. There was no malicious intent. Like Mayor Evans said, there was no one that was, you know, the city was aiming to get, so to speak. So I'm sure there'll be more discussion on this uh, later on. But yeah, that was the majority of Monday night's Jackson Council meeting. So for everyone who didn't know that. before, now you know. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> I did post the link. Uh, to watch that council meeting on the city's YouTube page. So if anybody's interested in seeing the whole thing, the yeah, link okay. is in the yes, comments. I recommend that. Um, also during that meeting, it was announced that the city of Jackson is about to start taking orders for leaf pickup. And that's going to start <gasps> Monday, November 1st. The giant leaf sucking yep. machine. It's so fun. <laughs> I love talking about it every year. They, they encourage you to put it by the curb, which doesn't mean in the street because that means by the, in your yard, yes. by the curb, not in the street. Absolutely, because if it gets in the street, then it gets into the storm sewers, and then it clogs up the whole system, Correct. and it's a mess. Yes. But that will last, like I said, from November 1st through Friday, December 10th, and you can call the City of Jackson Utility Office at 740-286-4419 and have a work order created for the address for pickup. And the city encourages... Um, all the leaf piles to be placed, like I said, curbside, and they must be free of branches, uh, sticks, and trash. So this work will start next Monday. I want to, <clears throat> I want to go out with the crew to suck leaves one day. I think that would be so fun. I think Wilson finally got one of those too. Therapeutic. Oh yeah. Just, it's like this giant like leaf vacuum thing. Yep. I think that would just be so cool. That's such a good way of, of doing it, too. Cause yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah. It's just like, come on. This is such a waste of time and, and yeah. effort to bag these things up. And then they get, then you have plastic bags. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Wilson had that issue for a long time, but I'm pretty sure they have a vacker truck now, too. Well, and honestly, let's talk about, you know, wear and tear on the storm sewers and things like that. Yeah. With, you know, people are like, well, I'm just not doing anything with my leaves because I'm not raking them up and, you know, putting them in bags or whatever, they are going down the storm sewer and then that's creating clogs and... And that, you know, and then any any problem that happens with the uh, sewer system results in the treatment of more sewage, which results in more cost to the city, which results in more cost to you. you. Yeah. So the better you can take care of your infrastructure, the better off you're going to be with your wallet, especially. Absolutely. So take advantage of the giant leaf sucker. Yeah, I recommend it. Yes. Um, also, right uh, right at the beginning of Monday night's council meeting in Jackson, uh, Mayor Evans swore in Jackson Police Department's newest officer, Christina Thompson. Oh, cool. Uh, there's a picture of that there. So she will be joining the force. I know that recently uh, Officer Kite left the department to um, and took a job in Chillicothe. So they keep they keep about the same amount, but it seems <laughs> like every time two. they... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, hopefully they can continue to build on that department. Um, they've got a lot of good guys over there now. Uh, Chief Potter recently resigned, or retired rather. Retired, yeah. Uh, so after his, I think, 25, 26-year career in law enforcement, he's, uh, he's at that age. He wants to retire. And now we have uh, Brett Hinch, the senior sergeant over there, is actually the interim chief for now. And I've heard that he's going to test to try to become the permanent chief. So yeah, I don't know if anyone people, else is interested or not. A lot of people don't understand that whole process. It's it's not like you just pick who you think right. should be the police chief. There's actually tests involved in, and in fact, getting hired onto the police force, mm -hmm. um, 
you have to take tests and you have to pass these tests. Yep. Um, and then the police chief, it's kind of you, whoever's interested, I, in my opinion, I think this is how it works, takes the test and whoever gets the highest score is the police chief. Yep. Not like, oh, we think this person or that person. or. And that's a test that's given by an outside group. It's the Civil Service Committee. Yes. Uh, so it's not anything decided, you know, by Mayor Evans or anything like that. It's, it's just whoever performs the best. Right. And... I don't, I'm not really sure exactly what would happen. I think that this is open to outside candidates as well. I don't think you have to be a Jackson police officer. I could be wrong. Oh. But I know in the past, in situations like this, this was open to anyone that was um, qualified. Oh, but so you could have someone come in and... I don't look for surprise. that to happen. But I, I don't look for that right. to happen. But I don't, I don't think that's an impossibility, mm -hmm. basically. Um, but... Interesting. All that I've heard is uh, Sergeant Hench or Interim Chief Hench is the one that is uh, interested in, in keeping that title. So we'll see how that plays out okay. in the weeks and months to come. Um, we'll move on to the city of Wellston. Uh, they met last Thursday. And again, it was... <sighs> It was kind of an aside to the actual main topic, but the issue of homelessness came up again um, mm -hmm. indirectly. Uh, Mayor Evans, or sorry, Mayor Charlie Hudson was giving um, an update on some upcoming infrastructure projects and even a possible um, tourism related project in Wellston. Uh, with regard to the infrastructure projects, uh, now that they're budgeting for next year, uh, he said some of the things they're budgeting for um, includes the paving of 2nd Street in Wellston from Minnesota Avenue up to Finley Chapel and 10th Street from New York Avenue to Mulga Road. And with that, he's hoping to piggyback with the county engineer's office and work out a deal where she agrees to um, match the city's efforts and continue on paving the rest of Mulga Road all the way out to State Route 32. So that's the infrastructure portion. Now we'll move into um, the tourism related thing, which with the American Rescue Plan Act funds that the city received in the first installment this year and is set to receive another installment next year, um, part of that money can be used for tourism. So oh. Mayor Evans said, or sorry, Mayor Hudson <laughs> said that uh, Service Director Anthony Brenner came up with the idea of creating a strip mine park, which is just the area we were talking about earlier that was being searched for the uh, for the missing person. Oh, okay. Um, so. He's not talking necessarily about the water portion, obviously, but the, the wooded area between where the recreational ball fields are and where the school campus is. Okay. There's a huge wooded space there. And so the city has been in the process of, of trimming and removing trees from that area as of late. Um, and there's about to be a, a big $1.4 million project through ODNR out at the recreational sports complex. Uh, to do a number of upgrades at a soccer field, you know, a lot of a lot of cool stuff out there. So Mayor Hudson felt like, why not, you know, extend that out a little bit. But the reason this got brought up in the first place, in addition to beautifying, you know, that area a little bit, is as the city continues to demolish uh, blighted structures in town that are vacant, I'll say that, um, there have been there's been an issue with squatters in those homes. So every almost every time they go to, to remove a home, they find that somebody's living there illegally. Those per, oh. you know those people are asked to leave. They then go to another vacant structure and live. But now that they're making you know a, a good bit of headway in tearing these homes down, people have opted to move into wooded areas around the city, including this area in question. Uh -huh. So there are paths that lead through from the sports complex, you know, up to the school campus that kids walk on a lot. And they're finding as they go out to break up these encampments and remove these trees and such that they're finding needles, other drug paraphernalia, some dangerous things um, gotcha. in these areas. Okay. So their idea now is to team up with the school district to, you know, try to clean that up, remove some of the trees so it's more easily seen and visible to, you know, everybody around. And he also mentioned uh, possibly creating a public owned campsite there where they could rent out spaces um, oh. for people and actually generate some revenue that would then be put toward the uh, recreational sports programs. Um, and code enforcement officer Ryan Peltier actually, you know, 
extended on this a little bit, and he said that the demolition of these vacant blighted structures in Wilson has been his department's main focus, which is one of his many departments. He's also the fire chief. Right. Um, but he, he wanted to point out too that the most the, as these people are moving into the woods, when the city demolishes a home, it's always vacant. It's not like they're booting somebody out into the street. These people were there illegally in the first place. Um, and he, he pointed out too that he's working closely with the police department and trash department as cleaning out these temporary camps is very important, especially when it's in such close proximity to the schools. So, there's that. That's interesting um, because there are so many people and I don't know, you know, I see it because of the restaurant that, you know, they have these tournaments and stuff where, I mean, people come from all over the state, mm -hmm. come into Wellston or whatever. Maybe if you have those campsites, they could stay right there, stay the night yeah. or two nights. Um, then they would be here. That would be great for tourism and, and economic development and all of that. Yeah. And he's also, uh, and Mayor Hudson's also mentioned in uh, the recent weeks of a possible project of extending Wellston's bike and walking path <clears throat> up to Lake Hope in Benton County. What? Yeah. And then wow, there was another uh, project related to that that is actually a more regional um, proposed project that's actually coming through the uh, Ohio Governor's Office of Appalachia with John Kerry. That would extend, it would involve that path, but it would take one from Lake Jackson and Oak Hill and extend it all the way up to the Hawking Hills, which <clears throat> is, I mean, visited by millions of people a year. Yeah. So if you could just bring a couple thousand of those people down this way, that would really boost uh, the economic portion of the cities a lot. Sure. So we'll see how that plays out. That's That's been discussed. Yeah, um, I mean, all you have to do is walk outside and, and look at look at the beauty right now, you know? Yeah. Like, just walk outside and look up. You'll see some really pretty trees and leaves and, and gorgeous uh, things. Absolutely. And speaking of that, uh, just coming <laughs> up coming up Saturday, uh, all the local communities have announced their trick-or-treat times. We'll, we had that in the paper yesterday. We'll go ahead and announce that again. Okay. Um, so, let's see. It is going to be 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m., in Jackson, Oak Hill, and Colton, and 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. in Wellston. And then in Vinton County, the Village of MacArthur will be Sunday, October 31st, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, Hamden Fire Department has announced the trick-or-treat will be observed uh, Saturday, October 30, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. In Wilkesville, it will be Sunday, actual date of Halloween, from 6 to 7. And then there will also be a trunk-or-treat event on Wilton Street, and uh, in Wilkesville, the, the residents passing out candy, they're asked to leave their porch lights on. And in the village of Zaleski, they'll sense. hold their annual trick-or-treat um, on Halloween, Sunday, October 31st, from 5 to 7 p.m. You know, and um, I know that the chamber here in Jackson's doing a kind of a trunk-or-treat in, mm -hmm. in conjunction with that. So if you're, I don't know, sometimes people just feel awkward about going up to strangers homes and and yeah. whatever um you know you can stay in the downtown vicinity of jackson there will be the trunk or treat where you know many businesses and whatever will will have opened up their cars and you can just kind of walk up and down broadway or and uh do it that way too i like that a lot because i've i always come to jackson seems <clears throat> a little safer than i guess letting the kids run all over the place yeah so i don't know i don't remember ever being supervised uh, on trick or treat as a child, I don't either. <laughs> I was like, cut loose and told to come home eventually. So. Right, like come home at dark or whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know. But I mean, my kid's five, so I have to probably keep an eye on him. Yeah. But we always come to Jackson. We always start right here at this building, and we go over to Megan's house first. Yep. And we make our way around, you know, Pearl and and South, and but these trunk or treat things, when it starts to get a little dark, which I mean, it's getting dark earlier and earlier. It now, is. And it's usually pretty cold. So, you know, we'll make our rounds to all the houses, but then we hit those trunk or treat things up to fill up that bucket, get yeah. it done. It, it's pretty nice. Plus, people decorate their cars all yeah. up. And it's, like, fun, you know? There's There's been more and more each year, too, it seems like. Yeah. I know there's, there's usually one down at the Christ United Methodist Church. 
Uh, the police department had one of their own last year, just out of the back of one of the cruisers. Oh, did they? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's yeah. cool. There, there's been one. Um, this was probably the chamber one that w at one point was set up at uh, Walgreens. Okay. Is that the one? I don't know. I'm not sure either. But there, there have been several. And I know that I think last year it was during the campaign season. So uh, Randy Dupree was out doing uh, something like that, I, I believe. I think Justin Skaggs was as well. Uh, we won't have that probably this year, but <clears throat> you never know. Never know. know, but um, no, that's so much fun. And um, so, when you take when you take your little one trick or treating, do you dress up too? No, and he asked me to specifically this year, <laughs> and I kind of blew it off. I, I I had plans to, but it really snuck up on me this Just time. Just be like, I'm newsman Phil. Oh, yeah, everybody so knows. I'm dressed up, I'm a superhero. I could probably go snack a mask because they have a um, a Halloween store there in Athens, uh, not far from where I live. So <laughs> I'm. I, I don't know. James I wear told glasses. Me I, it's hard to wear a mask. It but. is. It is hard to wear a mask. James <clears throat> told me I had to dress up tomorrow. So. Yep, oh. we're gonna have a Halloween party up here tomorrow, Phil. If you nice. want to come by again. Yeah. Okay. Come on okay. up. We don't really have any events planned yet, but we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, you guys can Courtney bop for said. Apples and stuff. Oh gosh, <laughs> Courtney said something about um, carving pumpkins, which is terrifying because. Number one, there's knives involved, and if you remember, I did get banned from the apple peeling contest at the <laughs> Apple Festival because I can't use a knife for squat. So, I carved a couple pumpkins last weekend, and I think I did a pretty amazing job. Did you? Yeah. Good job. I did. If I do say so myself, about five beers deep. <laughs> there you did go. Did an amazing job. <laughs> the steady hand. <laughs> Everybody lived. It was good. That's good. All limbs are intact. Yeah, I didn't cut my fingers off or anything. Yeah, yep. Um, I'll go ahead and make a, a little uh, sports announcement, too. Uh, yes. The Vinton County Volleyball team actually made history Tuesday night. Look at them. So proud. They won in three sets over Logan Elm to advance to their first ever district championship match in the history of the program. And they are going to face the top-seeded Sheridan team at 11 a.m. this Saturday at Southeastern High School. So congratulations to those girls there. Um, first little, time in team history. Just a little bit of talent there in Vinton County. Yeah, and <laughs> of course, I, I was talking to our sports editor, Todd Compton, about that yesterday, about that game. And he said, I don't know a lot about volleyball, but he said that they they, they made it look effortless the way that they won that game. He said, I mean, Super. three sets is the shortest you can win a game by in volleyball. And he said that they just made it look as easy as it could possibly be. So That's awesome. Hopefully they uh, come out victorious this weekend and can make history yet again. I was going to say, and then people in the state of Ohio are like, what is this deal with this <laughs> county people? A county <laughs> of 15 girls. or like 13,000 people total. <laughs> and they're just killing it. Yeah. So good on them. Yes, absolutely. And then the last thing that I have was actually uh, mentioned during the council meeting too. Uh, it was the Make a Difference Day that was held. This past weekend at Eddie Jones Park. Uh, well, what the heck's that? Well, it was youth members of the Youth Leadership Association, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and the Leo Club uh, all oh, cool. uh, collaborated um, to go down there and to uh, spruce up the park a little bit, put a new paint job on things, Look clean at up that. a little bit. How good that looks. It looks a lot better. Um, so it took place Saturday from... Uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and was the conclusion of one of the largest national days of volunteerism and uh, with grants being bestowed to the various local organizations by Serve Ohio totaling just over $15,000. Good for them. So in Ohio projects in 12 different cities were funded uh, bringing together 350 volunteers and during the four-hour event at the park the various groups took certain measures to improve the look of the park by cleaning the area scraping rust, dirt, and other signs of decay from the equipment, and painted it to make it look more colorful. So Love that. We'll have that story in uh, the paper soon. You know, I'll be honest with you. I don't remember. I know that we had clubs in, in high school and whatnot. Like, I remember being on, you know, there was, like, the health council and, you know, different things like that. But the things that these kids have the opportunity to get involved in now yeah. is just so amazing. And um, they're doing so much as youth that we just never no. had that opportunity to do. And it's just nope. so cool. It really is. So proud of them. It's like, 
you know, for the dog walk uh, or our dog event a couple weekends ago at the brewery, you know, I just sent Crystal Finch a message. I was like, hey, um, you know, I know you, you guys are into animals and whatever. And she's like, I'll have you some volunteers there. And this is like a couple of days before. Oh, wow. And, you know, I had like seven kids show up, raring to go, man, from the Leo's Club. I mean, and they awesome. worked and they... They were just so amazing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is great. And they were working two other huge events in town the same day. Oh, wow. They were helping with the fish um, the fish booth down at or the um, Lions Club booth. Okay. And they were also helping with the vaccination clinic at the church. Wow. So, I mean, they're just amazing, amazing kids. And if you see them out and about doing good, please say thank you. Yeah. Because they don't have to. They could be nope. sitting at home playing Xbox. Yep. They could be doing whatever they want to do. But they're helping. And they're volunteering their time. So That's, it's really yeah. good. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I thought I thought so. And, you know, they deserve to be commended. And it's the same, you know, throughout the, the county and our viewing area. It's mm -hmm. not just here in Jackson. It's everywhere that the kids are doing so much. Yeah, the art club members in Wellston have been oh, just those, going crazy. Those they're, murals? Yeah. They're getting all kinds of grants. Uh, they have a ton of more. They have a ton more projects planned. So yeah, these youth groups are really making a, a pretty positive, big impact in the communities. So and they have such good ideas, and honestly, they're just so inspirational. You know. Yeah, I mean, there was a group of kids in Oak Hill, even. Uh, so I'd just be fair and name all the Jackson County. Yeah, right. <laughs> communities. But they helped in the. Uh, um, the landscaping and sprucing up of the Imogene Brunton uh, Memorial Building there in the village. Uh, help move the rocks, you know, do the landscaping. Uh, so, yes, all these all these communities have a good group of kids that are more than willing to, to help out. They do. And uh, it's pretty neat stuff, if you think about it. All right. Well, before we get on to anything else, let's go over your weather forecast, because I know a lot of people are wondering what the heck it's going to do for your football games. And then we need to talk about that for a second, too. Um, so for today, um, let's see. Today is Thursday. Okay. James. That's okay. We still love you. <laughs> um, today will be cloudy. Rain showers are likely. Highs around 66 degrees today. Um, lows tonight around 53 with that chance of rain overnight about 100%. Uh, for tomorrow on Friday, darn it, uh, about 100% chance of rain once again, highs around 62, lows of 48, and then on Saturday, uh, mostly cloudy, well, darn it, showers likely again, with highs, whoo, only around 58 degrees, so, you know, looking throughout um, the rest of the weekend and to the beginning of your work week, about the same. Yeah. So. Man, I hope it doesn't rain for trick-or-treat. I know. That's a bummer. So yeah. Saturday, I mean, my goodness. So we have uh, playoff games going on yeah. here uh, tomorrow night in Jackson. Columbus South is coming to Jackson uh, for the first round of the playoffs. You said that is a 7 o'clock game? Yeah. Yeah, the Jackson game is like the normal time. 7 o'clock game will be broadcast on WKOV or the Total Media Radio app. Uh, Vinton County will be at... Byesville Meadowbrook, which is, um, you can't get there for here, from here, like east out, we decided that was out Close east to Zanesville. Of Zanesville. Yeah. yeah, upper on Bainbridge. Yeah, Bainbridge. Um, so that will also be Friday night, and you can catch that on WYRO, uh, or the Total Media Radio app. And then on Saturday, Wellston has to make that windy uh, drive down to Ironton. Yeah. Where they get to take on the mighty Ironton Tigers, uh, and that will be broadcast on Saturday, WYPC AM and also 105.3 FM. So we have <laughs> high school football playoffs going on. We have the Buckeyes playing Penn State at home mm -hmm. in Columbus. We have Trick or Treat. We have all kind of crazy stuff going on Saturday. And the Oak Hill Band is actually going to play at the Ohio State game. At the Penn Ohio State, State game, yes. In the Skull Session. In the Skull Session. Yep. Which I'm pretty sure that half the 
area is going to the Ohio State Penn State game. So whoever's left will be trick or treating <laughs> or at the Wellston game. So I don't know what's going to happen. That's a good point. There might not be uh, there might be some sad kids walking around here Saturday. I know. Empty There's candy nobody <laughs> home. <laughs> they have trunk or treat to fall back. Hey, listen, the trunk or treat will be there yeah. and, and you'll be good to go uh, in many of the local places. So mm-hmm. not a problem at all. But <laughs> So what's your little one dressing up like? I believe he's doing the ninja costume this year. Ooh. He was Batman two years consecutive. He was the Hulk his very first time, which when he was just, he was a toddler then. Oh. And then I think last year he was Optimus Prime. So this time he's going to be a ninja. Gotcha. And that was like... The fourth iteration of what he wanted to be. So <laughs> I see. You're just like whatever he puts on tomorrow. He starts planning this in like February. Saturday. So yeah, Shh. he's a big Halloween fan. Yeah. <laughs> so by the time we get around to when it's actually time to go, we've gone through four or five <laughs> ideas or actual costumes. So yeah, that is hilarious. He's always got a fallback. You didn't give him any like sharp ninja stars to throw, did you? <sighs> I didn't. I mean, his mom might have. So. <laughs> oh no. We'll see. You're like, great, I'm the one that gets to take him, though. No. Well, luckily, if it rains, I mean, I can always take him to Athens. I just don't know where to w- I would go. I've never ventured down those streets during, well, not I, for those reasons. I will anyway. tell you this. Athens has three trick-or-treats. There's Athens City trick-or-treat, there's Court Street trick-or-treat, and then the Plains has trick-or-treat. Oh, okay. okay. So you have a lot of opportunities for trick-or-treat in Athens. Well, I might have to do that then. I mean, I don't want to get soaked in the freezing cold, but I would much rather do it here. This is where I'm more comfortable. I know the route. I know the route to take. Yeah. You start at Megan's. <laughs> you can you start at Megan's, you can't go wrong. <laughs> I mean, like if you sh- if you show up during trick or treat in Athens, it's this it's such a crowd, you're going to know where to go. Uh, you yeah, just follow yeah, you, all the Yeah, you're not going to miss it. Follow the zombies. <laughs> yeah. I was always up there inebriated for other reasons as is, you know, in my yeah. It's normally a little I think they canceled that this year, didn't they? Uh, they're, not, they're not going to yeah. shut the street down. So they're not going to have that. I mean, saying it's canceled is like, you know, yeah, good luck. Ha-ha. Good luck with that. But they're going to do what they want to do. Yeah. The mob rules. Right. What were you saying, James? Well, I was just going to say the Athens trick or treat, I think, normally starts around four thirty, five o'clock. Yeah. Because okay. I always got stuck in it driving home from work when I lived in Athens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yippee. But no, that sounds like fun. It's going to be just such a a weekend full of of so much um again i feel like the past two weekends we've had all of this stuff yeah going on and you know so on and so forth through the holidays because that's just how it's going to be there's going to be a ton of church events and such over this weekend too uh we'll try to fit those all into this weekend's paper that's uh addition to the telegram so uh, it's too many for me to remember off the top of my head but i know i've gotten at least four or five just the past day or oh, two. man and you get past, I mean, you think about it, you get past Halloween, right? So, and number two, don't forget, I assume that the clocks move back this weekend. It always is this weekend. I think it's the weekend after next. Oh, it is? Because it's or typically Halloween weekend. I'm pretty sure it's the 7th. Uh, yeah. Daylight savings time is November 7th. Yeah. Oh, it's always Halloween weekend. I thought it That's was too. That's so weird. I look forward to that. I like, anytime I can gain oh, an hour of sleep, I'm 100% so for that. Now in the spring... Hate it. Hate it. I would much rather, I actually hate that so much that I would forego the extra hour of sleep and just don't do it anymore. I they just started don't doing know. that for farmers and stuff. Like, right. Not well, necessary. Why can't we just move it a half hour and be done with it and not move it anymore? Yeah, I think yeah, in, I think in the winter, since we have less daylight, that they should just make the workday shorter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like, you should be able to have an hour of daylight. Yes. After yeah. you get off of work, like your, your regardless work, of what time yeah. that is. Your yes. workday should shrink to like, I don't know, 10 to 2 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, there you go. Well, in the <laughs> winter, that. that's about when it starts getting dark. Yeah. And Good grief. You drive to work, it's dark. You come home, it's dark. You just live in perpetual darkness until May, and it's depressing. And, no and you wonder why everybody has... In May, it's cold and rainy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody has seasonal... Depression. You know, the, yeah. Yeah, depression. We all just lay around and get fat and mope. It's not, it's right. not a good time. And don't forget, you know, that global pandemic thing yeah, that say, we I've still have laying, going on. I've been laying around getting fat and mope because it's <laughs> March of 2020. <laughs> yes, it's March of 2020. Oops. Oh, I was doing that long before then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a reason now. Now we all have an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, is there anything else we needed to talk about, James? 
Uh, well, we will just remind everybody that we are moving the radio stations this weekend. Correct. It, sh- it will not affect the Friday and Saturday night high school football games. It will not affect the Ohio State game. Correct. Unfortunately, we are not going to be able to broadcast the Bengals game this weekend. And the Total Media app will also be down on Sunday. Okay. But yeah. everything should be back to normal by Monday. Fingers crossed everything back up and running Monday. So just be a little patient as this is a ginormous undertaking. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just to let you all know, too, once the radio gets moved, we will not be moving with them at this juncture. So you will be losing your radio um, Main Street TV broadcast for a minute mm-hmm. until we can... Yeah, just, get all just, in the same just, building. Yeah, again. just for the short term, not yeah. permanently. We should be moving um, soon. 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 We'll when we're all be one big happy family again. Yeah. I tell you, this building is a little empty. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it was weird to pull in here this morning and only see like three or four cars. Because we've gone from a whole lot of people to, to not very many. So it's been rough. But I don't know. It's quiet, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. It's definitely quiet. Until you go down here, Chris Henry's loud mouth. Just kidding. Chris. True that. True <laughs> that. <laughs> He's not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, have a wonderful day, everyone. We thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you, newsman Phil, for stopping up, spending your morning with us. Happy and to. Keeping us updated on what all is going on. So have a great day, and we'll be back here tomorrow with a little Halloween party for you. So look forward to that. We'll see you then.